1 Samuel chapter 1. As we begin this deep dive in the book of Samuel, let me just make a couple quick opening comments about the broader understanding of the book. First and foremost, just to understand, Samuel is not the author. And this is where it's tough sometimes in studying God's Word. We automatically think that's a problem, and it's not, because we have to understand both in ancient times all the way through to today. There are aspects, but especially when it comes to God's Word, first and foremost, if in fact it is God's Word, we believe it is God-inspired, and therefore, whether it is a writer or what we might in modern terms call an editor or a gatherer, that's where a lot of times, especially in the Old Testament, you're going to find that God has used a particular individual to bring together a thread of either stories or focus for God's purposes to teach. Samuel is one of them. Therefore, most likely the author was a prophet of Judah within somewhere between three to four generations after David's death who used Samuel Nathan, and perhaps one or two other prophets, written records and literary tradition, bringing it all together to create Samuel. And that's a reasonable understanding. So while Samuel was definitely involved in the writing, Nathan clearly would have been a, an obvious choice, and there might have been a couple others. But here's the thing. What the assembler did, and this we do understand very clearly, is that there was a literary tradition of ancient times where the book was often named using the first significant character, in this case, Sam. Originally, the book was actually one, and it wasn't split into two until the Old Testament was translated into Greek. And that's when it was broken into first and second. So with that in mind, that is one among the many reasons why I'm going to be going through the entirety of Samuel, both first and second, because in the end, it is meant to be seen as one book. Now, this is, book is what you would call a, an historical narrative. Now, as soon as we say that, in modern vernacular, we think history book, facts, dates. And see, this is what DJ and I knew seemingly better than most of you. History is not history of facts and dates only. It's people. History is about people. Now, when a history is written in the Bible, another key question is, how did ancient Israel use this book? Did they use it like a history book? Well, I'm going to quote John Mackey, who... Uh, wrote the commentary that I'm one of my primary uses, and he says this, the historical books of the Old Testament do not provide an exhaustive chronicle of the period they cover, nor do they seek to explain the events they describe in terms of political or sociological factors. Their focus is on demonstrating how God works out his purpose by directing and shaping human affairs particularly those of his chosen people, and the incidents these books record are selected within, with that end in view. So whether you're talking first and second Samuel, Ruth is technically listed as a poetical writing, but it has some of these historical narrative elements to it. Joshua, even elements of a book like Daniel, which obviously is hugely prophetic, you're going to find historical narratives scattered throughout the entire scripture. We are not to use it as some form of exhaustive, chronological thing we point to as some proof text. Friends, God doesn't need us to defend him. He doesn't need us to prove that he exists. He needs us to be faithful, and therefore he was gracious enough to give us a book, the Bible, to help us know him. He is this focus. So the very same way that Israel used the historical narrative, 
I would simply tell you, this needs to inform and shape the way we, therefore, use it. This definition also tells us one vital thing as we study this book, and that is this. There is one primary character to be focusing on throughout the study, which is God. It is too easy to get caught up in the human characters as if they're primary. So please understand, we will talk about Samuel. We will talk about Eli. We will talk about Saul and David and all these other people that we would think we quickly relate to, although we have no idea what it's like to be king, so I don't know why we say that. But anyways, I understand the temptation to make any one of those characters, especially David, primary. But he's not. God is the only primary character to be focused on. Because then it's God as he labors to fulfill the promises of Genesis 3, Genesis 12. So think of it this way. Here's a key question to be asking as we go through this entire book. When the event we're reading about took place... When it was written and assembled, what is God wanting his people to know about him? And what is he doing to accomplish his purposes? So let me give you clarity on that. When it took place, when the events of Samuel took place, Israel was doing its own thing. The book of Judges. That's when it took place. And that spirit that's laid out, and I read this last week, the final verse of uh, Judges says, in Israel there was no king, and everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. That is the mindset. That is the overarching truth that can literally tell us how to approach Samuel as far as when it was happening. However, we also need to keep this in mind. When it was assembled, Israel was a divided kingdom. The kings had failed. So the oral tradition of Samuel would be as it's happening and moving forward. The written, they wouldn't have received until Israel was already split into north-south. David's offspring, Solomon, had failed. God took and divided the kingdom under Solomon's son. The kingdom is split. Therefore, God's labor in Samuel's time is not strictly responsive to, his, to their behavior, but is in moving forward his plans to take back what was lost in the garden. The message to God's people revolves around what he is doing to do what he's going to do, I'm sorry, through his people. Therefore, if all other characters are secondary to his primary, do you start the story with the promised king or someone else? Because in terms of editing and assembling it, they already know some of the story of the failing of the kings. In other words, they already have a king. Now we're looking back. But the events talk about a specific time. And remember what Judges says. And in Israel, there was no king. We'll dig into that a little bit more in a minute. So let's pray. And we'll move forward. Father God, I just humbly pray for wisdom. I pray for your spirit's leading for all of us as we try to digest all that is here and to learn about you. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the deep, wonderful truths of your word. So grant us grace, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So as I already mentioned, Judges 21-25, you, you would think Ruth is next, and in our Bible it is, but not in the Jewish Bible. It leads right into Samuel. So, therefore, Judges 21, 25, if you were reading this as a Jew, you're moving from the end of Judges, because what was Samuel? 
Well, he was actually the last judge. And as you move into it, you're, you're moving into it as a Jew thinking there is no king. Israel is doing what it wants to in its, in, as it sees right in its own eyes. So then the very first verse, there was a certain man. What do you do when you read that? Well, immediately you start wondering, is this going to be the king? Is this going to be the fulfilled promise of Genesis 3, Genesis 12? Please understand, on and off, and I'm not talking about every single Jew, I'm not talking about every season, but throughout Jewish history, they are coming in and out of a clarity of thinking about when's the promise going to be fulfilled. For some, it was a devout an aspect of their faith. Meaning they were very genuine in their faith, looking ahead to what God had promised, anticipating it. Hebrews 11 tells us that. So I don't want to make it sound like every single Jew was rebellious because there were those who were devout and were actually literally about to look into the life of one of those people. But please understand, they are wondering, many of them at any given time, is, is this the one? So a man and his family, would this in fact be the king who saved? There is a man named Elkanah. Now, you actually have to look elsewhere to find out he's not an, uh, of the tribe of Ephraim. You'd think that, but actually we find out in 1 Chronicles 6, 33 to 38, he's a Levite. His family are Levites. Now remember, the Levites were actually scattered amongst all the tribes. They were supposed to have different functions and forms throughout all the tribes. He's a Levite who lived in the hill country of Ephraim, and he had two wives. Hannah, who had no children, and Peniah, who did. Now, please understand, polygamy was not forbidden by the law. However, practically speaking, just understand, from what we know of ancient history, it was not a common occurrence in Israel. So don't read this passage and think every husband had more than one wife. The kings are not an example to follow, so David, Solomon... This is not trying to establish a precedent. The fact is, there was a very practical reality in just the fact that hmm, women were expensive. I mean, wives were expensive. Um, but with that in mind, what the law did prohibit was child favoritism. Or more importantly, wife favoritism. So for just a second, think of Rachel and Leah as they were married to Jacob, who was the first child. Reuben of Leah, not Rachel. When Jacob died, Reuben was still first child. Just because, you know, so the law prohib would prohibit, now the law wasn't written during Jacob's time, so technically I don't, you know, how that all played out is different. But moving forward under the law, if you had more than one wife, you couldn't pick which child was going to be the blessing child. The law made that clear. Um, but with that all in mind, it's not a common practice. So, in chapter 1, verses 3 through 8, we find out the family has a ritual and that the family is very broken. Year by year, this man takes his family to worship at Shiloh. Shiloh is where the tabernacle, at the in, in the process of Joshua and the taking of the land, that was the tabernacle's resting place. And... After uh, all things considered, they, they would travel there from the hill country, and they came annually to worship the Lord of hosts. Please understand, this is the first place this title is used, and it's used over 260 times. As Mackey says, this title designated Israel's God as the supreme deity who controls every other power in heaven and on earth. It was a significant title. The high priest was a man named Eli, with two sons serving with him. That's all the writer wants us to know for now. Elkanah would give sacrificial portions to his wives and children so that they could offer sacrifices to the Lord. Now, there's a lot of things we could jump in and out of. I just need to make clear one thing. There's going to be a variety of times where the idioms of ancient Hebrew 
don't translate well. We don't always know how to use them correctly, or we do our best. What we learn from this passage for sure is that Elkanah does love Hannah. It's it, the, the editor, the writer, placed Hannah first. That seems to tell us something. The emphasis on Hannah, 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 from Elkanah's viewpoint, seems that he loved her more. But she was barren. Depending on how the ancient idiom goes, either he just gave Hannah the single portion. It says double here, but it's an idiom. We're not sure if it's, it meant double or if it just meant that he simply gave her the required amount needed. Because she didn't have kids. In terms of the text and the context, I would say I actually lean towards the second. But that doesn't matter as much as this. Their faithfulness as a family, their faithful obedience, actually makes Hannah's barrenness a problem. If you're just reading the story, under the belief structure you would have had in ancient Israel times, the fact that they are faithful would make her barrenness a problem. Why her? They're devout. Hannah is devout. You see, they would have had a similar belief structure that a lot of people had in Job. Job, all this disaster has hit you. Clearly you have done something wrong. Even the law and some of the other portions that uh, will be written talk about the fact that childbearing is of a blessing of the Lord. Therefore, the casual observer watching Elkanah's family would scratch their head because he's a faithful Levite. His family is faithful and devout. And yet one of his wives is barren. Therefore, most likely, most likely, whether it's whispered or however it's handled, people would shun or look down on him. Because she was barren. Now, what does the editor tell us, though? The editor, the writer tells us, the Lord had closed her womb. Well, the average person wouldn't know that. <laughs> and the fact is, Elkanah and Hannah wouldn't know that. And therefore, what we see here is a woman in significantly deep distress. This situation is very similar to that of Jacob, Rachel, and Leah. Elkanah seems to favor Hannah, just like Rachel was favored, even though her womb is closed. Quite real, the reality is, he probably married Paniah just to make sure he had kids. Ladies, how would you feel about that? I mean, honestly, just think about that. You're being used to make sure you've got, he has kids. Uh-huh. Benaiah, who had children, would actually, probably out of a bit of bitterness, knowing she was more highly favored, she would provoke Hannah, just like Hagar and Sarah. Hagar would bring little Ishmael around, you know, and be like, <laughs> I've got the kid, you don't. You know? Benaiah would provoke Hannah, and it says she did this regularly. She would shame her. This would cause her to weep in shame. While the husband, now here's the thing. Why are you crying? Because your second wife is being, well, I'll let you all fill in whatever happens. If you want to fill in, she's being a meanie. She's not very nice. And that was just adding to the distress. So how much grace do you want to give Elkanah is totally up to you. He clearly loved Hannah. He did care about her. He was concerned. But in typical male fashion, he makes it more about him. What's the difference between this statement? Let's see. How did he say it exactly? Am I not more to you than ten sons? As opposed to Hannah, you matter to me more than ten sons. Gentlemen, can you see the difference? I'll move on. Okay. The reality that Elkanah does not shame her, however, himself, 
and the fact that Hannah seeks the Lord the way she does, does in fact reveal a seemingly a mutual understanding that her womb was being closed as a divine decision. There is still a sense of faith here. And therefore, it is reasonable to consider that they acknowledge that this is God's way. This leads us to verses 9 to 18. Hannah prays unto the Lord and makes a vow. In her distress, Hannah leaves the feast. So it's one of their annual feasts. They're there. They're doing sacrifice. Uh, maybe some of you might be confused. Remember, the sacrificial system, as far as the annual sacrifices, often included feasting with them. So you come to, in this case, Shiloh, as a family, come offer your sacrifices and then there would actually be cooked meat left. And they would then take the meat and go feast as a family. So all scattered around the countryside of Shiloh, if it's an annual feast, there would be many families present offering sacrifices unto the Lord. Well, she leaves the feast, and we've already been told that she doesn't eat. And she goes away praying at the entryway of the tabernacle, Weeping. As she prays, she makes then, for whatever reason, in this particular year, she makes a vow to the Lord. By making this vow, she reveals a faith that God has the power to intervene. And as Lord of all, she is expressing an amazing faith that he takes an interest in her care. What a story. Friends, think about what ancient times talks about. They believed in multiple gods. They believed in very impersonal gods. And quite frankly, that's not much different today. The majority of people's gods today are either themselves or the stuff of this world. Very impersonal. This very story all by itself shows us both the power and ability of God and the care and interconnectedness of God. This isn't about Hannah. Hannah simply expressing her faith about the truth of who God is. And so through this vow, she refers to herself as your servant three times in this prayer and makes a vow unto the Lord that if he would give her a son, she would then return the child to him to serve the Lord his whole life. Now, ladies, I want you to think about this for a minute. Let's just say, abiding by ancient times, Hannah is married sometime in her late teens. We have no idea how old she is at this point. But it does sound like this has been going on for a while. And she's saying, Lord, if you finally give me what I have been wanting, a child. I will give this child back. Guys, I'd ask you to think about that, and there is an aspect to think about that. But maybe, just maybe, if Elkanah had no other children, this would hit him hard too. But he's already has his progeny. He already has his inheritors. This isn't about that for him. And quite frankly, the husband in ancient times did not carry the weight of shame that a wife would. A, a mother of will. So I want you to think about the depth of what she's saying. This is, in fact, a very real expression of faith. I also want you to understand, according to the law in Numbers 30, verses 6 to 8, the husband could, in fact, nullify her vow. If, in fact, she had a baby, he could say, no, that's my child, especially if it's a boy. She also says this, no razor will touch his head. And I would tell you, this is part of the commitment she was making. Please understand the Nazarite vow, Numbers chapter 6, 1 through 21, is a very real vow. And therefore, even though it doesn't spell out the vow, the very fact that it talks about the razor... It's very reasonable to believe she basically made a Nazarite commitment. And there's only two others that we know of for sure that were under that vow. Samson, 
John the Baptist. Eli, the head priest at this time, is watching from the side. He sees her mouth moving. He hears no sound. So he starts thinking this woman is drunk. And understand, that's actually not unreasonable to think because there's feasting going on. There's a very real possibility that one of the family members, somebody has come along, they're drunk, and they're standing at the front side of the uh, tabernacle gate, and they're drunk. So he proceeds to scold her. I will take it a little further and say it's also very possible that it reflects that in his own heart in not being able to see true piety when it's right in front of him. But then Hannah responds very humbly. She refers to him as she ought to. And she tells him that she is not drunk, but rather pouring out her soul into the Lord. Once Eli sees this and understands it, he doesn't apologize, but he does offer her a blessing of peace, very possibly the blessing out of Numbers chapter 6. According to Deuteronomy chapter 10, all the priests were, that one of their primary functions actually was to offer this blessing to the people of God whenever they had an opportunity. What is amazing is that this this moment is one of the only times it's recorded in Scripture that a priest actually did it. And then he prays on her behalf that the Lord will grant her request. Here's what's wonderful, amazing thing about Hannah. She receives this, she prays, she makes her vow, she receives the blessing from Eli, and then she returns to her family. And what does it tell us she did? She What does that tell us? She accepts that the Lord will do as he wills. She has literally cast her care upon the Lord and left it there. Friends, she returns to her family and revealing a humble acceptance. We then get to chapter 1, 19 to 20. The Lord answers Hannah's request and blesses her with a son whom she names Samuel. And just as God divinely closed her womb, he now opens it. Please understand the phrase, the Lord remembered her, has nothing to do with memory. I, I just want to make that clear. This isn't about God going, oh yeah. I just remembered him. This has to do, this is a, once again, a, a ancient Hebrew idiom, and it is referring to this idea that God is remembering the covenant promises that he has made to Israel. Because in the end, what he is going to do with this child is continue on the journey of fulfilling all he's promised. So then we get to chapter 1, 21 to 28. Hannah fulfills her vow. It comes around time again for the family to travel to offer sacrifices. Hannah remains behind to finish weaning the child, which means by the time she brings him, he's actually somewhere around three. And she intends to bring him to the tabernacle to fulfill her vow. Elkanah yields to the reality that this child has been divinely given and is willing to abide by his wife's vow, as both express faith in God's working through this birth. So remember, not only has she made the vow, not only then has she received the child, not only is she going to fulfill that vow, her husband expresses his own aspect of faith by going along with it. It says that she brought him that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. This is a formal statement recognizing that, the, in this case, the boy would stay at the tabernacle in the Lord's service. She arrives with the proper sacrifice and then presents Samuel to Eli. She reminds Eli of who she was and that the Lord had indeed heard her heart's cry, so she was there to fulfill the vow she had made to the Lord, and it uses another idiom. It says lending. We think lending in terms of temporary. I will lend this child for a while, and then he'll come back. But she, she almost, you would think, the way we think, would sound like she's talking out of two sides. She says, I'll lend him. He's going to stay here forever. But that's the way that this was understood, is that this was a giving. This was a lending to the Lord's service. 
And we know from chapter 2, verse 11, that the family went home after their time of worship. Samuel remains ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. Now, what tribe is his father of? He's a Levi. So therefore, the idea of Samuel functioning as a priest, in the end, he actually is reminiscent of Moses in many of his functions. And many of the things that he ended up doing. He is not Moses' return, let me be clear. But he is of the tribe of Levi. He judges the people of Israel and he performs minor aspects of priestly function. Keep that in mind as we move forward. We get to chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and we actually come across Hannah's second prayer. In this case, however, we're actually given insight to the actual prayer. Hannah prays in significant contrast, first of all, to the current times that she's living in. What does it say about Israel? They did what was right in their own eyes. Her prayer is totally opposite of that. Her prayer reveals how her faith shapes her worldview. Everything she's done in her distress has been shaped by her faith in the Lord. She expresses gratitude and joy that the Lord produced for her. She expresses the truth of who God is, which stands directly opposed to the view so many in Israel were living by at the time. Her prayer shouts the truth that whatever our life situation, God is working his will in his time, and we may have, we may have one quality of life one day, and we may then have another quality of life the next day. Friends, this isn't a prayer of her saying, oh God, thank you for giving me my son. This is a prayer of expressing faith to understand that whatever life I have today, tomorrow may be different because you are God. You are the Lord of those who are poor one day and who have plenty the next. You are the Lord who are alive one day and gone the next. She is expressing nothing but a prayer of faith and theology, rich in meaning. This isn't just about her getting her request. This is about her expressing truth about who God is. And the fact that he, his labor in each and every life matters. He is the Lord. Her life is just one example. But her prayer focuses on the greater truth. Friends, God intervenes and works in and around every life, for he is the Lord. It leaves us with that question in the back of our minds, do we accept his sovereign hand, and, or do we choose to think we are above it or beyond it? Now, what's very fascinating is the last thing she prays over is the Lord's hand to protect and care for his people through the rule of his anointed king. Let me read 1 Samuel chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Now, Horn, in that context and usage, is talking about strength, okay, directly related to a bull. The horn of a bull is the relation of his strength. Verse 2, there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. So that is exalting who God is. Then, verse 4, the bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren is born seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and exalts he raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. Nowhere in those verses does he talk about the righteous or the evil. 
She is not contrasting good and bad people. She's just praying the truth of what God does. And then you get to verse 9. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Now he's talking. she's talking about God's people. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken into to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointing. Here, horn is directly related to the idea of anointing. What is another word for the anointed? Messiah. She prays over the Lord's hand to protect and care for his people through the rule of his anointing. Prophetic and inspired of God, I have no doubt. You see, Genesis 17, 6, all the way back to Genesis, God tells Abraham that kings would come from him. In Genesis 49, it says that the scepter would not leave Judah. In Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20, the law, it actually lists the requirements of a king. So all the, is it a stretch for Hannah to hope and pray that in light of all of Israel's current problems, God would save them by anointing his king soon. How interesting that Samuel's mother prays this prayer. Friends, if we are trying, we're trying to teach or remind a people of their past, so now I'm talking about the age of a divided kingdom, while giving them truth concerning their future, concerning the promise and hope of a Messiah, where would we start? Well, if God chose to start at a place by telling the story in a time that would reflect not only the anointed one, but the one who would do anointing. We see the same thing for Jesus. Jesus had John the Baptist. David had Samuel. Samuel's manner of birth was very similar to John's. They both were committed to the Lord under a Nazarite vow. They both had strong ministries of their own, and yet... Their primary role was to prepare the way for the king. God was teaching a broken Israel that while they have ignored his word and covenant relationship, they have also forgotten his promise of one who would save them. And so both in the time of Samuel and in the time of bringing together the book of Samuel, God's message is the same. You're not listening. You're not remembering. But I have not forgotten you, and I have not forgotten my word to you. And I am in the midst of doing a great and mighty thing. Instead of starting the story of the king with the birth of the king, God chose to reveal his purposes, his power, and his grace through not only the story of the king, but through those who would serve the Lord in order to bring about this king. You know what's really interesting? We're part of that story. We are the Hannahs and the Elkanahs. And there may in fact be some who at some point will be a Samuel. But God being rich in mercy not only saves us, but then calls us to serve his kingdom until the return of the king. We are not kingmakers, but we are beloved secondary characters who serve the king who is also our savior. Church, serving the kingdom starts with a spirit very similar to Hannah's. Hannah was often lost in distress and shame, and yet she was faithful. I want you to think about that. Hannah didn't have control. But instead of trying to cope through the things of the world, or in her case, idols, she prayed. She sought the Lord. She humbly accepted whatever the Lord decided to do about her request. 
And she gave the highest praise as she experienced his grace and blessing. In other words, her prayer life revealed her worldview. How about us? Her prayer life revealed her faith in God's promise of salvation. I wonder, do our prayers and choices and behaviors reflect our ongoing trust in God's gift of salvation and the daily course he sets for us? This study, this book is going to impress upon us over and over how important it is to set our hearts and minds on God as the one and only primary character in the story. Who then chooses to bring us into his grace and love, making us part of his family, his kingdom, his labor? Let me say it again. We are not kingmakers. But as Hannah said over and over again, we are his servants. So friends, I ask this. What is the king wanting Are we willing to, as Hannah did, lend it to him to do as he sees fit? In other words, whatever the Lord may call us to sacrifice, are we prepared and willing to do it? Her prayer life reflected her worldview very strongly. And I just hope and pray that that is a growing reality for all of us. Yes, the Bible, and therefore I, must teach the ideal to reach for. But understand that it is the gift of His Holy Spirit that both teaches us, humbles us, and helps us to grab a hold of it. So ask for the Spirit's help. To understand that the Lord is, in fact, setting the course of your life every day. Because it's a part of His labor to accomplish His final promise. That we get to be a part of. We're not the kingmakers. Samuel was. And God used that to fulfill his ongoing promises, leading all the way up to Messiah. Amazing story. That we're just getting started. Father, I pray, grant us mercy as we continue to walk this journey and understand more and more of the truth of your word. But above all else, to understand that. One of the hardest things for all of us to do is to sit, or should I say, step aside from the throne and to let the King, the King Jesus, sit upon it day after day, moment after moment. We are not king makers, but I pray, Lord God, that we live our lives as submissive, willing, and adoring servants to all the wonders that our King is doing until his return. May we be found faithful. We pray this in Jesus' name.